Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Plain Politics, the Psychology of Human Workplace with Dr. Carlin Borisinko. I do want to take a minute to give us some housework, house tools. No, house, house, thank you, housekeeping tools. Thank you, Katie. Um, for the online people, we want to make sure that they can hear the questions, so I'll be going around with the microphone. So if you raise your hand, um, we'll come bring the microphone to you, and we are doing all the questions at the end of the presentation. Okay. All right. Hey, everyone. Hi. How's Vegas treating you guys? Anyone want some money? Yeah? A couple of people. I just lost like 15 bucks at slots before I came here. I'm sure I'll lose many more before I leave. Whatever. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today, guys. I like, my name was expertly pronounced by, by my introducer, but I'm Dr. Carlin Borisenko. I'm an organizational psychologist, and I work with individuals and organizations all over the world to help create better work experiences. So this is kind of some of the stuff I'm up to. I'll tell you a little bit more about some of this stuff, just a brief st uh, stint as I get into the presentation, but let's get into the good stuff, right? Because you're all here to talk about office politics. Like, of all the sessions you could have come to, you came to the session about office politics, right? But actually, I'm really glad you did, because office politics is one of those things that is so commonly misunderstood and really not discussed at all on, at conferences like these, or especially not in the office. And because of that, people have really, really bad feelings about office politics, right? My goal here for the presentation today is to get everyone in the room to look at this concept in a little bit of a different way. So it's not scary, it's not mean, it's not evil, it's not something that only the bad people do. Because there are reasons why every single one of you, if you work in an office with other people, might want to consider engaging with office politics because organizations are much more political than most people realize. And you might be one of those people that thinks, you know what, I'm not going to play office politics. I'm going to go in, I'm going to keep my head down, I'm going to do a good job, and that's how I'm going to get ahead. But the thing you need to understand is that regardless of whether or not you choose to play politics, everyone around you is. And when you choose to opt out, that means the people who are not as smart as you and not as talented as you are going to get promoted ahead of you. And no one wants that, right? We want to be rewarded for the hard work that we're putting in. But there's another reason that we want to think about office politics and really learn how to engage with it. Because when you do it well, you can get a lot of stuff done in your organization. If you want to, you can be a change agent. Because engaging with this type of information will help you to be able to achieve more. And we have to stop looking at office politics as something that is inherently evil. Maybe another way to look at it are just the unspoken rules of the workplace. And let's be honest, just because rules exist, it doesn't mean you have to like the rules, right? What we're not talking about here is a fantasy world of rainbows and unicorns and everything's perfect. That's not what this is. What we're talking about is how our brain is hardwired to work, how people make decisions, how we respond to other human beings. The information I'm gonna give you here today is true of every single person in this room, is true of every single person that you know, even though I guarantee you, probably about 50% of the people in this room are really going to fight against this idea. You're not gonna like some of the things I talk about at first, but if you can lean into it and just learn to play with it, it's really gonna help you out. It also might help to think of politics as influence. And in any organization, in any social system, in order to get things done, we need to be able to influence other people. If you're in a leadership position, you need to be able to influence people to follow you. If you are a manager, you need to be able to influence people to get them to do what you need them to do. If you're an individual contributor, you need to be able to influence people to work with you because none of us work in a place where we're just off on an island all by ourselves. We need the help of other people. What we're really talking about when we're talking about office politics is learning how to adapt your behavior. And we adapt our behavior all the time. We behave differently at home than we do at work or than we do at church 
or than we do at our kids' school. And I go to a lot of events like this, and I know you all are adapting your behavior and things like this. I'm betting more than a few of you have adapted your behavior in Vegas. Come on. And so adapting your behavior to different situations in the office is really no different. You're just doing it in a little bit of a different way. And when you do it well, I promise you, I promise you, you're going to be more effective, you're going to get more stuff done, and you're going to be a whole lot happier. So we're going to spend the next hour or so going over my five principles of office politics. Now, if you come up with a question during that time, please write it down. I've left plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Um, but we're going to get through the five principles first so you can see the big picture of what we're working with here. So let's dive into it. Principle number one, people are not logical and rational. They're not. We desperately want people to be logical and rational. But I think we also instinctively know that that is just not true. And I'd like just a, a show of hands if you feel comfortable. If your boss is in the room, you might not feel comfortable. All right. But a show of hands. How many of you have done something completely illogical in the last week? Yo, oh, this, this one here is very excited. <laughs> Yeah, about 50% of you just raised your hands. And, I'm, and for the people who did it, like, you're in Las Vegas. Like, come on, this is the place to do something illogical. Please, like, make good use of your time here. <laughs> but, you know, that's not to say that people don't use logic and reason in their decision making. They do. They just use it to justify what they've already decided to do. Okay, and now to explain why this is, I'm going to tell you a little story, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the brain works. Does that sound good? All right. So several years ago, I was traveling to a conference. I live in New Hampshire. Um, I was going to a conference in Austin, Texas, and I showed up at the airport at like 9.30 in the morning on a Sunday, and this is when I was finishing up my doctoral coursework, and so the only book I'd had the foresight to put in my bag was an advanced quantitative research textbook. And as thrilling as that topic is, it was just like not what I wanted to read at 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning. So I went to the airport bookstore, got my your typical kind of paperback bestseller, got on the plane, sat down next to this really nice looking older dude in a very nice tailored suit. And he's on the phone with his wife and they're laughing and joking and just kind of smiled and sat down, opened my book, started reading. A couple of minutes later, he hangs up his phone, starts striking up a conversation with me. And of course, a couple minutes into that, he says, oh, what are you reading? Now, I don't embarrass easily, but I have to admit, I may have turned a few shades of pink when I showed him my copy of Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> and I confessed that I was reading smut. And you know what? He was a good-natured dude, and he laughed, and he took out his copy of the Wall Street Journal. He pointed out not one, not two, but three stories about men in high-level government positions getting caught having affairs on their wives and having to resign their positions because of it. And he said, look, I'm reading smut, too. <laughs> now, what does this have to do with office politics? Nothing. Not a damn thing. But now I know I have your attention. And I know I have your attention because of how the brain is hardwired to work. For our purposes here today, I want you to think of the brain in three distinct parts. The old brain, the midbrain, and the new brain. The old brain was the very first part of our brain to develop way, way, way back when we were cavemen. And it is interested in three things. It's interested in food, survival, and sex. That's it. And it is constantly scanning our environment, looking for those three things. And when it finds one of those three things, it perks us up, bing, like a dog that has just seen a bone. It says, pay attention to this. This is important. Now, we are not consciously aware that we are constantly looking for food survival or sex because that information is processed on a deep subconscious level. And we take in a ton of information as the old brain is doing this. We take in 11 million pieces of data every single second across our five senses. Now, if we were consciously aware of that, we would go insane. That's not a manageable amount. So what the brain does is it filters out all of the information that it deems unimportant in this moment. And that leaves us with about 40 pieces of data that we are consciously aware of. So I just want you to keep that one in mind, right? 11 million pieces of information goes in, 40 
that we are consciously aware of. There is a huge disconnect there, right? And I'm sure every single one of you has experienced this. So think about a time when you're driving home at the end of the day and it's the same drive you do every day after work and you pull into your driveway and you don't remember driving home. Does that happen to anyone? Yeah. Yeah, now you didn't fall asleep. Like you made it home, it was fine. But your old brain, because nothing was really happening, it was kind of monitoring the situation and just put you on autopilot. But if a dog had run out in front of your car, it would have perked you to attention and said, danger, 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 hit the brake. And when it does that, we've all probably experienced something like this, that you feel that rush of energy go through your body, right? And you perk right up. That's your old brain telling you this is important. Now, the old brain tries to use all of those 11 million pieces of information to try to make all of our decisions for us. But when the decisions do not relate to food, survival, or sex, it has to consult a friend. And it consults the midbrain. Now the midbrain is where we process all of our emotions, whether or not we feel happy or sad or angry or anxious or stressed out, all of those things. Uh, it's just like the old brain, this is also on a deep subconscious level. So example I'll give here, and my husband who's here today will totally appreciate this example. Um, think about a time when you have been in a fight with like a partner or a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend and like you're in this fight you want this fight to keep going you're just like you I see some smile like some some people know who I'm talking about and all of a sudden part way into the fight when you're just going on autopilot you forget why you're angry <laughs> yeah that's that's the midbrain right there but the midbrain also processes things like nonverbal cues that we pick up all the time from the people we're interacting with so think about a time when and this often happens at work you walk into like a meeting room at work and there are a couple people sitting there and before anyone has said anything to you you just know something is wrong right that's probably happened to a couple people now that's a gut instinct right there's no logical reason to think that something is wrong when you walk into a room if no one said anything so gut instincts are our brains way of delivering us information that it's picking up on that subconscious level and it's giving us the answer it's just not telling us how we got there so don't ignore those instincts they're coming from somewhere so we have the old brain which is about survival we have the midbrain which is about emotion and then we get to the new brain. And the new brain is what gets us into trouble. Because this is the part of the brain that processes logic and reason. And it is also the only part of the brain that we are consciously aware of. And that's why we think we are logical, rational beings. However, in terms of decision-making hierarchy, the new brain is not really all that powerful. So if I were to put this in the terms of like an organization chart, we have the new brain, who's like the director. Directors can make some decisions, right? But we have the midbrain, who's like the vice president. And we have the old brain, which is like the CEO. And all that leads to what's gonna be on this next slide. Now this next slide, if you take nothing else away from this presentation today, I want you to take a picture of this slide or write it down, put it on a sticky note on your computer monitor at work. It explains almost every single interpersonal problem you will ever encounter. Human beings make decisions emotionally and then they justify them rationally. I'm just gonna give you guys a second with that one. Human beings make decisions emotionally and then they justify them rationally. All right, everyone got their picture, are we good? Fantastic. So now what that means is that there is no such thing as an objective reality because we filter objective information based on our emotional response to that information. And so when it comes to office politics, that means that office politics is inherently irrational. If you try to treat this as a logical, rational process, you will lose every single day. Ben Franklin knew this. He said, would you persuade? Speak of interest, not of reason. And the problem is that when we go into work and we're relying on data to make our case for us, to make the argument, we usually end up failing because emotions will always win out over logic every single time. 
Now, for some of you in this room, I know this feels like a gut punch, right? Like you are not liking this information. I understand. I, I, I used to be one of you. I get it, right? And you can say, well, damn it, I'm just going to do what I want to do. I'm not just like oh, just emotions. We don't cry at work. Come on. But I promise you, if you just embrace this and learn to flow with it, it's going to really help you out. And that brings us into principle number two. So if we accept that people are not logical and rational, then we need to figure out a way to start to appeal to those emotions, right? So principle number two, relationships are the goal. I'm going to say this another way. You need to get people to like you. You need to get people to like you. Because people think that influence comes from where you sit in the org chart, right? Who reports up to you? Who, who do you report to? Who can you fire? Who has the ability to hire people? They think that influence comes from the org chart. And how many of you have MBAs in the room? Fair, a fair number of you have MBAs. What do they call this in MBA textbooks? They call this legitimate power in those textbooks, right? But the fact is that when it comes to influence, the organizational chart is actually the weakest type of way that you can influence people because it's really, really hard to change. And frankly, if you have someone that reports to you that doesn't like you, they're not listening to a word you say and they're doing the bare minimum to get by. That org chart, that position, that title is not the thing that's going to get them to do their best work. So another option we have, other than looking at our position, is being perceived as an expert by our coworkers. If you are perceived as an expert, then you are going to be able to influence in the area that you are perceived to be an expert in. However, perceived is your key word. Now, if your boss is in the room, do not raise your hand to the next question I'm going to ask. All right, how many of you have ever worked for someone who has had no godly business being hired into the position that they were hired into. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But guess what? Someone perceived them to be the right person for the job. That's why they got hired. And most often, that is influenced because the person who was hired had a relationship with the person making the hiring decision. Right? That's how that happens. And we've known this for a really long time. There was a study a hundred years ago, came from the Carnegie Foundation that said 85% of your job success comes from your soft skills. Only 15% of it comes from technical knowledge about how to do the job. So this was a hundred years ago. That was in the age of manufacturing where literally everyone had one very specific job and all they had to do was that one job. And even then, only 15% of their success came from technical knowledge of how to do that job. If this study was rerun again today, my money is on that number is going to be even higher. And that's why relationships are our secret weapon, because it means you can influence without relying on the formal structure. Because let's be honest, like we don't just work with people in our one silo in the org chart. It doesn't make sense. We have to work with people in different areas. Relationships also means you can tap into that emotional part of the brain to start building those connections and influencing in that area. Anyone remember this movie from a couple years ago? Wasn't this like a great movie? Man. So for those of you who didn't see it or maybe need a little refresher, um, Benedict Cumberbatch played Alan Turing, who basically invented AI, right? But Alan was like many geniuses. He was incredibly socially awkward, right? Yeah, Alan did not understand the value of having people like him. He didn't really care. He just wanted to build his mach machine to break the unbreakable Nazi code and call it a day. He would have been perfectly happy working by himself. And Alan, because of this, pissed off everyone he was working with. No one liked on his team liked him. No one wanted to work with him. No one was helping him build this machine until he had his friend Kira Knightley. And Kira Knightley was like the only person on Alan's side. And one day there's a great scene in the movie where they're in a bar and Alan is struggling and Kira says, Alan, you need to get them to like you. 
And so the next day he listens and he tries. The next day he comes into the office and he has a bag of apples. He gives everyone an apple and he tries telling a couple jokes and he's still horribly socially awkward so it doesn't go over at all. But his coworkers see that he's trying. And because of that, they tried. They softened their attitude towards him. And so a couple months later, when Alan's boss comes to fire him because the machine still isn't working, his coworkers stand up for him. And they say, if you're going to fire him, you're going to fire us too. And all that leads me to my next point. You do not wait until you need something to start building relationships. This is something that you have to start doing now with the people that you work with. Go back to the office, the next day you're in the office, think about who do I need to have a better working relationship and you get started now because if you wait until you need something, no one's going to be there to help you. All right, and that leads to principle number three. How do we build those relationships? Well, we have to understand that people have different natural preferences and tendencies. I'm gonna say this another way. People are like cats and dogs, right? How many dog people do we have in the room? Yeah, I'm a dog person myself. These are my two little bastard dogs. Aww. I have a Chihuahua and a Chihuini. The Chihuahua's name is Honey Robocop Poncho Tequila. <laughs> she, names, she answers to both Honey and Robocop. The Chihuini's name, which is a Chihuahua Dachshund mix, if you don't know what that is, his name is Kobe Baratheon, first of his name. <laughs> because it really just makes me laugh that anytime the vet calls me, they have to say I'm calling in reference to Kobe Baratheon, first of his name. <laughs> and as, as you might be able to tell, like I'm one of those dog people. You know, some people use their social media for like work-related stuff. Not me, no. If you follow me on Instagram after this, you will see pictures of two things, my knitting and my dogs. And that's it, right? And so you'll see pictures like this picture of my husband balancing a beer on my dog's head, or this picture of my dog showing off their new haircuts, or this picture of my dog showing off my knitting, which is like a twofer. And then we have the other dog photobombing in the background, or like why this picture of my dog hasn't gone viral yet, I really don't understand. Now, here's my point. I don't understand cat people. <laughs> like, it really, it eludes me why anyone would choose the love of a cat, which basically hates you, <laughs> and only keeps you around because you feed it and give it milk and the occasional catnip. I just don't understand why anyone would choose the love of a cat over the love of a dog. But I don't think cat people are bad people. Like, I don't think you've made poor life choices. We just have different values. We appreciate different things. And the same thing is true of different styles when it comes to work. Every single person you know brings a different style of preferences and tendencies with them when it comes to work every single day. There's no good or bad. There's no right or wrong. We just all choose to do things a little bit differently based on our life experience, based on how we were raised, based on how we were treated when we were little, little kids. Every single one of us does things a little differently. Every single one of us has strengths and weaknesses, right? Now, when this is talked about in kind of pop culture, some of the, things, some of the ways they reference this is like you can be an extrovert or an introvert, right? Being an extrovert or introvert isn't fundamentally good or bad or right or wrong. It's, they're just very different. But this, isn't, this doesn't quite get at the point I'm making. And listen, like, don't even get me started on millennials. The fact that we think that we can characterize how people do things based on the 20 year span of time in which they were born just boggles my mind. And yet you'll see articles on LinkedIn if you go on there today, like how to manage millennials. God, and by the way, millennials are no longer the younger people in the office. Like, hi, I'm Carlin. I just turned 38 and I am a millennial. So they're not just the young kids anymore. We got a whole new generation to worry about now. We're not going to get into that today. But <laughs> what I want to say now in regard to this is that it's much more complicated than just where you get your energy from and the year that you were born. But what we want to do is make an effort to really understand the preferences and tendencies that people are bringing to work with them. And then once you understand what their preferences are, you can adapt your behavior to it. 
That's what we're shooting for because it's not about doing what you want to do if the other person is not going to receive it well, if it goes against what their preferences and tendencies are. What things, so I'm about to make a broad generalization about people who work in, in this type of industry, right? Which is that you guys love your details. You guys are the ones that write the really long emails explaining things, and then you attach a spreadsheet to it with lots of numbers and rows to explain things even further. And then you try to send that to like the, your vice president or your boss, and do they ever read those emails? No. No, because they have a different preference and tendency. Most of the time, people in leadership position, they get an email with like several paragraphs and a spreadsheet, their head explodes. Right? So we have to adapt what we're doing to the people that we're communicating with. Now, the easiest way to get a handle on how to adapt your behavior is to do something like the disk profile. I am a big fan of the disk profile. When they're done well, there are like a lot of bad disk profiles out there. Excuse me. But when you do a disk profile and it's a good one and it gives you like top quality information, it is freakishly accurate. It's like your magic bullet to understanding what your work style is and how to adapt to others. So some of you may have done something like this. Um, if you haven't, I would definitely ask about it at work because it's a brilliant tool that's just incredibly helpful. But if you don't have something like this, or even if you did it like 15 years ago and you don't remember what your results were, there are other things that you can do to learn how to adapt your behavior in different situations. The easiest thing that you can do is to mirror the people that you're working with, is to pay attention to what they're giving you, what, how they're writing emails, how they're speaking in meetings, what type of information they look for, and then trying just to do that exact same thing back to them because what people show us typically is aligned with what their preferences and tendencies are, right? These are the things that people do when they're not thinking about it, when they're just kind of going on autopilot. So if you can give them what they're giving you, that's a really, really good place to start. And this is how we start to really engage with people's emotional needs. This is how we start getting at that thing that triggers how they are making decisions in the workplace. A couple other things to think about when you're building these relationships. Um, can we talk about listening for a second? Guys, waiting to talk and listening are not the same thing. They are not the same thing. I can't tell you how many times I'm in meetings with people and either, like, there, there's a couple different scenarios. So I was in, a, I was in a, a board retreat last week. I was facilitating a retreat with a nonprofit board. And I was giving them advice. They asked me for feedback on how they were doing. I was giving them advice. They weren't listening to what I was saying. And they were repeating things back to me that had no relevance to what I just said to them because they weren't taking a moment to just put aside what their preconceived notions were and just to take in the feedback I was giving them. So we were going like this for like three hours. It was a brilliant experience. I had a lot of fun with that. But, <laughs> but the most common place that I see this is I'm, I, I end up sitting in on like a lot of team meetings. I'm like that person in the background. This is like, I'm just paying attention to how the team is interacting. And so in many of these team meetings, what happens is, you know, people go around the table and, and they give their update about whatever they're working on. And they, they ask for things from their team members or they make the case for what they want from their team members. And I can't tell you how many times, like, you go around the room and person after person after person, they're all saying basically the same thing. They might be using different words, but they're basically saying the same thing. But none of them recognize that they're saying the same thing because they're not listening to the other people in the room. They're just waiting for their turn to talk and they're rehearsing in their head what they're going to say when it's their turn to talk. We've got to stop doing that. So in the work I do, I'm often brought in to, to coach the problem children in organizations, right? The people that are causing all the interpersonal problems and they, they hire me and they say, you need to fix this person. You need to teach them how to communicate. I'm like, all right, let's, let's do this. So we have lots of meetings. We have lots of discussions. And I got to tell you guys, like <laughs> I hear from one of these people, like every, like a couple times a month, I get an email from one of these people saying, Carlin, you are the only person that listens to me. And great, job security, cool, but 
It pisses me off every single time because the organization should not have to hire someone like me to have to provide these people with someone to listen to them. I'm about 75% convinced, and this is never something I should admit in polite company, no less on video. Oh my God, what am I doing? But I'm about 75% convinced that the fact that they have a person to talk to, that they perceive has their vested interest at heart that's really just giving them their full attention, I'm pr about like, almost convinced that just the fact that that exists is the reason why their behavior improves. And you all can provide that to the people you work with. You all can give every single person the gift of a full and attentive ear. And when you do that, they're going to know that you have their back. And this is binary. People either perceive that you have their back or they perceive that you do not. And if you per they perceive that you don't have their back, that you're someone that might throw them under the bus or isn't going to support them or that's going to embarrass them in, in a meeting, they're always going to hold back from being fully invested in a relationship with you. Because remember, our brain thinks about survival first. Survival in a work environment means keeping your job. If they think that someone might do something that would endanger their job or their promotion or their raise or their livelihood, they are always going to have walls built up to have a full relationship with that person. And I think that one of the biggest relationship inhibitors in the work environment possible is email. Email drives me crazy. Now, listen, I told you guys, I'm a millennial. Like, you'll pry my cell phone out of my cold, dead hands. Right? I am not opposed to technology. I love technology. But you know what? Technology gets in the way of human interactions. It creates more interpersonal problems in the workplace than I can possibly tell you is this propensity to do all of our communication over email. Right? Email is great for lots of things. It's great for scheduling a meeting. It can be great for passing a file back and forth. Sometimes it's good for if, you're, if you just need to send a quick note to someone like, hey, I'm running late. Please get the meeting started without me. Beautiful for all those things. It is a very poor tool when it comes to human interaction. Get up out of your chair. Go talk to people. Or if you can't do that, pick up the phone. Or if you say, Carlin, we work in two really different locations, get on video chat. We have so many tools available to us to help us build these relationships over great distances. And we have to start doing this because no matter if you are the most brilliant email writer in the history of emails, people do not emotionally engage with the words on that screen. They need to be able to see you. They need to be able to hear your voice. Remember, we said that people make decisions emotionally, and then they justify them with logic. If someone gets up on the wrong side of the bed, is having a really bad day, and they get a short email from you that's totally innocuous, what do they do? They're like, why is that email so short? Why didn't they put a smiley face in that email? Right? And they start creating all these problems over a flipping email. Just go talk to them in person. I promise it's going to help you build better relationships. But the most important piece of relationship building is this. You have to learn how to be vulnerable. Aw, this is for the cat people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't forget about you guys. So, <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a story. So um, several years ago, I worked in this really, really, really toxic place. It was like, it was bad. I won't go into the deals, but it was bad. And I would go home like every day crying, and I would pick a fight with my husband, which he really appreciated, because I was so angry I couldn't <laughs> release it at work. Um, so there's this one guy in the office that he and I were just antagonize each other like all the time. He was like this old curmudgeonly guy that had been doing his job for 30 years and he didn't appreciate this millennial coming in and having different ideas. Right? So we were constantly for months and months and months pick, 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 back and forth in every single meeting we were in together. And so it reached a, a culminating point where um, we were in a meeting with like 12 other people and he just unleashed on me in this meeting in front of all these other people. I was so embarrassed and I was pissed too. Like, and you know the point when you get so pissed off when you just can't speak? Like that was the, the, low, the level of pissed off I was after this happened. So this meeting happened to be right before lunch and so I got up from that meeting, stormed out of the office. I went to Buffalo Wild Wings for lunch. 
It was boneless wing Thursday. <laughs> and I ordered a very big plate of buffalo wings and a very large beer, like big as my head, large beer. And I sat there and I ate my buffalo wings and I drank my beer until I was good and ready to go back to the office. Um, however, the beer might not have been my most brilliant choice. <laughs> Because I still wasn't done when I got back to the office. I stomped over to his office. Fran, I'm gonna knock over that podium. I stomped over to his office. I slammed the door and I said, What is your problem? And the way he looked at me in that moment, I have to tell you guys, like, I just knew that it had nothing to do with me. His outburst had nothing to do with me. He was getting it from all sides in the organization and I just happened to be the person in the line of fire when he just couldn't take it anymore. And this was this thing that precipitated us having a talk and really opening up to each other and really like sharing what we had been going through and how it made us feel and, and what the challenges were that we were facing from everyone else in the organization. And I gotta tell you guys, at the end of this talk, like there was crying, there may have been a hug, Right? There's all these emotions happening. But after this talk, we were like BFFs for the rest of the time that I was there. And he was still old and curmudgeon and he didn't understand me at all. And I didn't really understand him and his perspective. But we were like this. We had connected in that moment. Now, I understand that's kind of an aberration. You don't really want to have a blow up in a meeting to be able to build those relationships. But this, like our walls had come down and we both allowed each other to see each other in a very vulnerable place. And what this allowed us to do was create psychological safety between the two of us. This study came out from Google like several years ago where basically what they did was they studied all the different working groups at Google and there are no low performing teams there, right? But you have kind of like your average team and then you have your high performing team. And what they wanted to do was to look and see what differentiated the high performing team from every other team at Google. And what they found by a mile was that the high performing teams had a very high level of psychological safety with one another. So they were able to take chances, they were able to take risks, they were able to fail and they knew that their teammates would have their back. They knew that it was, nothing negative was going to come from that because they trusted the people that they work with. That was what set those teams apart. And this shouldn't have really come to, as any surprise. Does anyone recognize this from when they took Psychology 101 in college? Right, this is Maslow. Some people like when I show Maslow, some people are like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> but I actually think that this, this makes a lot of sense because look, when it comes to our needs as human beings, there's a hierarchy of these needs. So above all else, we need the basics, right? We need like food and air and water and sleep. If we don't have those things, we're probably dead, right? Because we can't, we can't survive as human beings if we don't have those things. Once we have those, we look at our safety needs. Do I feel secure? Am I going to get hurt today? If we are constantly, and by the way, safety, when it comes to the work environment, again, is am I going to lose my job? If we are constantly afraid of losing our jobs, that, that we're going to get fired at any minute, then we're not going to be able to achieve our best work. So once we've got that taken care of, what do we look to next? Belongingness and love. Having respect and appreciation from the people around us. So let's draw this back to building better relationships and having influence in that way. If you really, really, really want to build better relationships, do what you can to help people feel psychologically safe around you. Even if they don't have that from other people, help them feel psychologically safe around you. You guys know those people in meetings, I'm sure every single one of us knows someone like this or works someone like this. Um, when you get into the meetings, you always have these people who they're the ones that always have to get up in the meeting and like beat their chest and say their piece, even if they've said it a million times before and you know exactly what they're gonna say, right? You know what drives those people to do that? It's not what you might think. Some pe most people think that they just, that makes them feel powerful to do that, to get up and speak in these meetings and say the same thing over and over again. They do it because they want to feel powerful, right? 
Here's why they're really doing this. Because they feel powerless. Because these opportunities are one of the few outlets that they have at work in order to feel powerful. And we want to feel powerful. We want to feel as though we have control over our experience. We want to feel appreciated. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But so many people are dealing with issues at work where they just feel utterly powerless most of the time. I'm going to give you an example of this. How many of you, let's just say you want to go back to the office and, and you've decided that the office chair that's at your desk, like it really hurts your back and you want to order a new chair. How many of you would be able to just go order a new chair without asking anyone's permission? Yeah, not that many of you. Maybe like what, like 10, maybe 15% of the room? Not that many of you could order a chair. This is a $200 office chair. And you're gonna tell me that you can't order a chair, but you feel are completely empowered in every other aspect of your job? Probably not, probably not. And so, you know, we can't change that overnight but one of the absolute best things that you can do for yourself and for the people you're working with is to give them their power back, to help them feel empowered, to help them feel listened to, to help them feel appreciated. The number one thing people want out of a work experience is not a paycheck, it is respect. That's what they want and you can make this your goal. You can make this a part of your job. When I was working in that really negative, toxic place, I, 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 for so many reasons, I could not be successful in what they asked me to do. Um, so I decided to create my own measure of success because I didn't want to go home every day and feel like I had just wasted eight hours of my life. So I created my own measure of success. Here's what it was. I, I said, act with integrity, show compassion and empathy, even when others don't, and be of service to people around you. And I wrote that on a sticky note and put it on my monitor, I wrote it on my whiteboard. And if I achieved those three things on any given day in that organization, then I had to consider that a successful day. No matter what else happened and what this did was put me in control of whether or not I had a good day. Because to that point, Everyone else was responsible for if I had a good day. And that didn't mean a whole, that didn't work out well for me because it was a, ba a toxic place to work, right? You can give yourself that empowerment to create your own measure of success, create your own personal mantra. And if you're going to do that, make it about service to other people because that's what's going to help you build those relationships. And you do this even if it's outside of your job description. The words, that's not my job, are some of the most toxic words that we can use when it comes to work. That's divisive. That puts up the wall and says, I'm only responsible for this box of stuff over here. Everything else, you guys got to figure that out on your own. Well, that doesn't help people think that you have their back. All right. So the old adage of treating people the way you want to be treated, it's wrong. It's wrong. What we're trying to get to in this is that it is about treating other people the way they want to be treated. And that's when you can bring them along with you and influence them and make it a better experience, not only for you, but also for them. All right. So in order to do that, we want to follow principle number four, which is always being on the lookout for the win-win. When I first started doing this talk several years ago, I, I read everything I could possibly read about office politics. And I came across this article on LinkedIn and you know it had like half a million views at the time. But I kind of looked at the profile of the guy and I was like, dude, you look like a bro. Like, I don't know what you had to say that's valuable here, which is horrible and no one should ever do that. But that was my first thought. And but I said, you know, it's got half a million views. I'm going to read the article anyway. And so I got down to the bottom of it. And I was like, oh my God, you just got it completely wrong. You lived up to your picture admirably. Because is rule number 10 for him, he had, there are only losers in office politics, never winners. 
I was like, that is exactly the wrong answer because if you are playing politics well, then you are only creating winners. Being successful at work does not mean you need to defeat other people. It's looking for ways for everyone to win. I was having a chat out here with a, with a guy that um, runs a CPA Academy, which does all these free online trainings um, for folks like you. And there was, there was me and another woman that presents for him. And we're presenting right at the same time. We're presenting now. And he looked at us and I was like, you two are competing against each other. And both of us at the same time said, no, like, there's more than enough win for both of us. Like, some people will go to her session. Some people will go to mine. It's all good. We don't have to push other people down in order to make ourselves feel good about what we're, what we're doing. Another word for this is compromise. Oh my God, in today's day and age, like people have forgotten how to compromise. They wanna dig their heels in and not give an inch, and you think that's a way you're gonna be able to work with people and make your, all of you successful? I mean, come on. Has anyone ever seen this guy speak? Does anyone, no one in the room has seen Arnold talk? Mm. I gotta tell you, if you ever get the chance, go, go see him speak somewhere because um, I saw him at a conference like a year and a half ago, something like that, and I, I, I'll, I'll admit it, like I only went to this talk because my husband really likes Arnold and I wanted to take a picture of it and text it to him and be like, ha ha, Victor, I got to see Arnie. That was the only reason I went. But yo, like he's smart. He's really, really smart. And he was talking about how, um, how he brought all the different healthcare stakeholders together in California to try to talk about fixing the healthcare system in California when he was governor. And what he said to them before they even started the discussion in the room, he said to them, every single one of you in this room should expect a seven out of 10 coming out of this meeting. None of you should expect to get a 10 out of 10 because if you get a 10, that means that guy over there is getting a three. And that's when it all falls apart. In order to really play politics well, we have to be looking for a way to get a seven out of 10. Get some of what you want, but be prepared to give up a little bit in return because it is better every single day of the week to get 50 or 60 or 70% of what you want and to give someone else a win than it is to get 100% of what you want and to piss someone else off. Because what happens when you piss people off? They carry that around in their back pocket for years, just waiting for the moment to get you back. All right, and in order to do this, in order to really give people a win, we have to understand what their motivations are. What do they want out of the conversation? When it comes to, to change management and these type of things, if you're trying to put together a project and you want to champion a new initiative, oftentimes people come back to this idea of fear. And what do they say, right? People are afraid of what? Blank, fill in the blank. What do, you, what do they say? Change. People are afraid of change. How many people believe that people are afraid of change? Yeah? Fair, fair bit of you, maybe like 50% of you raised your hands. Maybe you guys were being a little timid because you know where I'm going with this, I think. So no, people are not afraid of change, guys. Like things change around us all the time. People get married, they get divorced, the kids go off to school, you move into a new house, this pumpkin spice latte comes back at Starbucks. Like things change all the time. People aren't running down the street screaming, right? So what is it really? It's that people are afraid of loss. They're afraid. Remember, we talked about people feeling really powerless. If people are powerless and then you say, I'm going to take another thing away from you and I'm going to take this thing over here, I'm going to take that thing over there, people are afraid of the implications of the change. So if you want to influence people into doing whatever you want them to do, you have to make sure you understand what they think they are losing. Change management initiatives and organizations fail like 70% of the time because this question is not considered. Because the thing you're trying to change was championed 10 years ago by the person that is embedded in the organization and that you can't fire, 
right? They're not giving up what they want. They're not giving up the thing that they championed. They're not giving up the thing that they built because if they do, the implication is what's left for me? People need to feel like they have a purpose when they're coming to work. And so the question then becomes, how can we help this person feel powerful in this situation? And it can be really, really helpful to understand who your allies and your enemies are when it comes to work. And what I mean by ally and enemy is not who you like and who you don't. This is not like high school, although work can be more like high school than we ever dare admit. Um, but that's not really what this is about. This is about whose goals align with yours and whose do not. Because you have a finite pot of resources in any organization and you want to make sure you are aligned with the people who are using those same resources in the same way that you want to. They're your allies. People that want to take those resources and use it in a completely different way than you, those are your enemies, right? Whether you like them or whether you don't. If, if, if your BFF at work wants to take those resources and go in a completely different direction than you do, they're the enemy. Now, I think it's really important to understand who these enemies are. And so what I often tell people to do is really think about this, really think about the people at work who you might consider your workplace enemy. Now, here's what I don't want you to do. I do not want you to go back to the office, take out a fresh new notepad, write workplace enemies at the top, <laughs> and then leave it at your desk. And if you think someone hasn't done that before that's seen this presentation, there's a reason I'm giving you that piece of advice, right? Because <laughs> people are going to misunderstand it. Don't do that. But understand who your enemies are and understand what they want and what they're trying to achieve. How do they want to use those resources? So once you've got that in your head, we're going to look to Sun Tzu to get a little piece of advice because I really like advice from dead people. So the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. And build your enemy a golden bridge to retreat across. What does that mean? When you figure out who your workplace enemies are and you figure out what they want, you give it to them. You give it to them. Even if you really don't like this person and it's gonna really get your goat to give them a win, right? You give it to them. I oftentimes I'll coach people who are having interpersonal challenges with, with other people that they work with. And oh my God, I say, well, why don't you give them a compliment when they do something well? Like if they do something that you like, why don't you say, oh my God, that's great. Give them a really nice compliment, make them feel really good. Like Carlin, why would I do that? Like, I don't like this person. It, it, it like goes to every fiber of their being to give this person a compliment. But this is how we build those relationships. This is how we turn people around. Now, the biggest piece of feedback I get when I get to this point in the presentation, because I always read all the feedback from all the evaluations, and the biggest one is people saying, Carlin, of course I'm always looking for the win-win. I don't even know why you would bring that up. Of course I'm always doing that. And I call BS. I call BS. Not because you don't have good intentions but because you're busy, you're stressed out, you got too many things to do, you have deadlines that you need to hit, you go on autopilot and you just go. And I know it's BS because one of the things I do is I'm the chief science officer of a company called Rallybrite. And what I do with Rallybrite is I actually go in and I measure team resiliency quantifiably. Okay, so we know what makes up a resilient team and I can measure how resilient your working group is. And the number one thing that separates highly resilient teams from every other type of team is their propensity to give of their resources to help out a coworker. Their propensity to look for that win-win and to proactively give it without being cajoled or begged or bribed, just to do it because they know it's the right thing to do. That's the number one thing that creates a highly resilient team. Does anyone want to take a guess and just shout out your guess? Does anyone want to take a guess at what percentage of teams in the United States are highly resilient teams? Someone said five. Any other guesses? I guess we're going to go with five. You're close. You're close. Two percent. 
two percent. It's actually a little less than that. It's actually one point seven percent, but we round up because we want to be a little bit generous. Two percent of teams have that trait of giving of their resources to help other people out. And again, it's not because you don't want to, but it's something we need to make ourselves be more mindful of and work to integrate into our experience. Because what happens when you start giving your enemies wins? What happens when you hand them compromises? When you, when you say, you know what, I know you don't want to do this. Here's what I'm going to do for you. Or even just giving them a compliment. Guys, I can't tell you how good a compliment or a simple thank you feels to people when no one in the work environment is ever thanked enough for their contribution. So what happens when you do this over and over again? You're going to stop being your enemies. It's like magic. If you work with someone and they're giving you a win over and over again, guess what's going to happen? They're going to see you're someone that's easy to work with. There's someone that's not going to make their life difficult. You're someone that they can, they can have a conversation with, that you're going to be reasonable. And you instantly turn your enemies into allies, even if you both still want different things, because you are the path of least resistance. And that's a welcome breath of fresh air. So in order to do that, we get to principle number five, which is to always, always, always pick your battles. Because political capital at work is not finite. You're never going to run out of it. But it is fluid. And so if you use up all your political capital fighting battles that don't matter, you're not going to have anything left over for the battles that do. And sometimes the most effective thing that you can do in almost any situation is just to keep your mouth shut. Like of all the pieces of advice that I wish I'd listened to when I was 25, oh my God, I would have avoided so many problems if I just kept my mouth shut. I couldn't change it anyway, just zip it, right? And that's hard to do when we feel passionately about something. It's hard to do when something really fires us up. That one takes a second. Yeah, you got it. Because there'll always be more battles to fight. There'll always be more battles. We can't possibly effectively um, take on every single front. So the rule of thumb that I like is that if you find yourself getting heated and you, you feel that passion start to come and you feel yourself about to go on autopilot, just take a beat, take a breath, ask yourself, is this a battle that I can win? Is this a battle that makes a difference? Or do I want to save this for something bigger? Because we want everyone to have passion at work. It's a beautiful thing when people are passionate about their jobs. But too much passion can be a weakness. And it can get in the way of you doing the things that you really want to do. I'm going to say this another way. We've got to emotionally detach from some of these situations. Now, Carlin, you told us that we make decisions emotionally. How can we emotionally detach? Because once you're aware of what's driving those decisions you can make the choice to do it differently. You're no longer on autopilot. You're no longer have this subconscious thing ruling what decisions you make. You can make the proactive choice to do it differently. Um, the most zen thing you'll ever hear me say is just try to be like water. Be like water at work. Now, what does that mean? Does water go uphill aggressively? No, no, I know we're in Vegas and we don't have water here, but like, like I, like I know you guys know that, right? Water flows downhill and finds every crack and crevice along the way. That's what we have to be like. If something is happening that you don't like and you want to have influence in that area, look for the path of least resistance. Don't get up in the meeting and beat your chest and be that guy that no one likes. Look for the way that you can get in there a little bit more effectively. I got this piece of advice from a mentor about 15 years ago. I've never forgotten it. She said, Carlin, you're very smart. Everyone knows you're smart. But sometimes it's not about being right. It's about being effective. Most valuable piece of advice I ever got, though I didn't see the value in it until like 10 years after she gave it, <laughs> which I've apologized to her profusely since then. All right, so those are my five principles of office politics. Now let's round it out a bit, and then I'll take some questions. Now, with great power comes great responsibility. I have just given you all a room full of people, and whoever is watching online, 
the, all, everything you need to know to really navigate office politics in your organization and to do it really, really effectively to get what you want. But we have a, an aversion to this idea because a lot of people who know this stuff use office politics for evil. You can make the choice to use it for good. You can make the choice to use it to help other people out, to help people feel empowered, to help your team become more resilient, but that is your choice. It's your choice how you use the information. So when you walk out of here, go back to work, I'm gonna advise you to focus on building those more human connections. Be more empathetic, be flexible, be likable, be a little bit vulnerable, know when to keep your mouth shut, and to balance good relationships with doing good work. And that's your key to the kingdom. All right, if you enjoyed this talk, I'm gonna have a few more uh, quick, quick plugs. If you enjoyed this talk and you'd like to get these slides, um, I think they're in your app, but you can also take out your phone and text playing politics to 345-345. It'll come back, ask you for your email address, put your email in and you'll get an email with the slides. I will also send you a link to a six part, six part series of articles I wrote for Forbes that covers all the points I just talked about. Um, I also wrote a book, it's called Zen Your Work. It uh, goes much more in depth into all these details. So if you liked the presentation, you might like the book. Um, and with that, I'm just gonna open the floor to questions and see what questions you guys have for me. She stands here nervously waiting for someone to ask a question. We have a few online. Ah, excellent. So I think this one goes back to when you were talking about people just standing up and talking at meetings. Mm -hmm. It says, what about people who like to hear themselves talk, people who go on tangents all the time in meetings? It's the same thing. It's, it's exactly the same thing. People who like to hear themselves talk, they're doing it because it makes them feel powerful in a universe in which they don't feel powerful. If they're going on tangents, it might be because, well, like, let's just give people the benefit of the doubt for a minute. Like, if people are going on tangents, it's because they're trying to express something, but they maybe haven't fully formulated their thought yet, and they're, they're talking out loud to try to get there. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? If we expected people to have fully fleshed out statements at every possible moment like po probably nothing would ever happen into meeting in meetings and discussion would never happen so just give them the benefit of the doubt and, and you know let them let them go through their process and be there to help them along the way any other questions oh got a hand over here we do have three more in line. excellent So I do have a habit of just saying what I like to say. All right. And I've learned that a lot of people don't like that or don't know how to receive that. But like when it comes to relationships in the office, I often find that people just don't see me. Whether it be that, you know, maybe I'm culturally different or maybe I'm, I'm just different from what they're used to. So mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to say, hey, great job, when they're not even paying attention to you. So what do you do then? Well, okay, so you've, you've brought up a, an interesting point and we're gonna do, um, a little, a little self-reflective work here. So how they see you does not impact whether or not you have the ability to give them a compliment. Yeah, it might not feel good to give them a compliment. You're like, because you, you're looking for that compliment in return. Like, don't, don't, don't expect reciprocation. That's the biggest thing. So if we go back to that sticky note where I had my personal mantra up and I said, be of service to people around you, I did not say be of service to people around you if they're going to be of service to you. In fact, I said be of service to people around you even if, if they weren't going to be of service to you because we can't control other people. We can't control them. And this is the big problem that a lot of people run into is we put the, we put the onus on them to change or on them to do it differently when in fact we could start doing it differently first. And if we start doing it differently, we're going to give them permission to do it differently. I'll tell you guys a little story. And this is something I actually talk about in my book quite a bit is about controlling your contribution. So, um, there's a technique I learned from my coach about dealing with people that, that you don't like how they're treating you. And it goes like this. It's not what I think of myself. It's not what they think of me. It's what I think they think of me. And I'll tell you the story behind it. So my coach is like, 
this like happy dude. He lives in LA. He puts on a very high value on him being happy in his day to day. He's also a creature of habit. And so every single day, he goes into exactly the same Starbucks and orders exactly the same thing. Now, one day, he showed up to his Starbucks, and there's a new person behind the counter. And she's giving him the evil eye. And he's like, what's going on here? Like, why isn't she like me? Everyone likes me. I'm only happy when people like me. That's not really what he said, but, you know, that's what he's feeling. And, <laughs> and so he's showing up day after day. The same woman's behind the counter. She's giving him the evil eye. It's throwing off his entire morning. And so he went and said, you know what, Joshua? It's not what I think of myself because I think I'm awesome. It's not what she thinks of me because I'm not a mind reader. I have no idea what she thinks of me. It's what I think she thinks of me. And so what he did, it was so brilliant. He said, you know what? I'm not going to tell myself that she hates me or that she doesn't like me. Instead, I'm going to tell myself that she totally wants me. <laughs> and she's giving me the evil eye because she totally wants me. So what did he do the next morning when he walked in that Starbucks? Struts in there, starts flirting with her. Like, he's not trying to change her. He's only changing himself, right? A couple weeks later, she's giving him free coffee when he comes in every morning. Because when we change our approach to other people and we allow ourselves to, to receive that from them, we change them in the process, even if we don't know it. So I would just, for you, focus on what you can control and what you're giving to these people. Don't worry about their responses. That's not your business. Your business is what's going on with you. Does that help? It is. No, and she said, for, for if you couldn't hear, she said, it's just exhausting to do it. It is. It is mentally exhausting to do this. But if you do, it's kind of like, um, like going to the gym when you haven't been to the gym in a while. Like you're flexing different muscles of your brain when you do this. You're flexing muscles you may, may have not used in a while. And so it is exhausting at first, but if you can give yourself like 30 days... I promise it gets easier after 30 days because you've built new neural connections in your brain and so it makes it a lot easier. So if you push through the pain, it'll help a lot. Oh, we have a couple of questions over yonder. Okay, while I'm walking over there, I'll read an online question. What would you name three books we want to read in this area? <laughs> Yeah, I knew that would be one. Not too <laughs> no, um, so so I like um, I like Cy Wakeman's book books a lot. Cy Wakeman's written a lot about drama in the workplace, and she studied that. I also um, I like Sean Aker's books about just being happy in general, and you, that the fact that like every single one of you has to, has the ability to make the choice to just be happy regardless of what's going on around you. So my book, Cy Wakeman's books, Sean Aker's books. Yeah. My question, oh, sorry. My question <laughs> is, I have a tendency to get misunderstood in certain settings where I'll say something or write something or whatever it is, and then people will say, oh, my God, she's this, she's that. And I'm like, no, 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 I didn't mean it that way. And then I try to explain myself, and then I can see that, okay, they're still not buying it. Yeah, because so you look defensive at that point. Correct. Right. So then I'm quiet, which is how I adjusted my behavior, which looks like either I don't care or I have no or I have nothing to say or I did mean it the way they said. Yeah. So I feel attacked, but I don't want to continue that dynamic. Yeah. So this is this is a great question. And so um, I, I'm going to make a broad generalization about work style when it comes to to this particular industry, which there is a very, very, very specific work style that a lot of people who do this type of work are drawn like they have that work style and they're drawn to this type of work because of it. It is a work style that can be very, very skeptical and a little bit challenging um, and is incredibly powerful. Like it is like the get stuff done work style, but people outside of it, and that's like 75% of people, find it incredibly intimidating. And that is particularly true if you're a woman. So I don't know if you have that style, but what you just described to me says you might. And what I would say is just it's okay to, to try to soften the approach 
a little bit, but I also, I don't want you to, I don't want to dissuade you from making the arguments you want to make or asking for what you want or for making your point. And so you have to find a balance between how can I adapt to these people in my communication style to really get them to receive what I'm saying? Um, and how can I, as an empowered person in the workplace, make my point and frankly not give a flip what they say? And the thing of it is, it's so funny. The minute that we stop caring about people's reactions is the minute they start reacting to us really positively. So I guess the, maybe the, the, the highly practical piece of advice I would give to you, take a disc profile. Find out what your work style is um, and use that to help you adapt your communication so that they receive it well. But big picture, like make the point you want to make, be proud about the point you want to make, and just detach emotionally from their reaction because their reaction is not your business. Okay? Okay, we only have about five minutes left. I see a question here. How do you recommend dealing with uh, situations where you have an irreconcilable binary conflict and compromise isn't really possible, kind of uh, orcs and elves? Yeah. Um, I, I actually will not accept the premise of the question <laughs> in that I don't think there's ever any conflict in which a compromise is not possible. It might not be a compromise you want to make, but I, I, I don't accept that there's not another solution that can, that can help both parties. And, um, you know, the thing of it is it's sometimes it's just a lack of creativity in looking at things differently. As we get older, our ability to be creative and look at things differently rapidly diminishes. So they've done these experiments where, like, they ask kids to look at a, look at a paper clip and come up with how many uses you could possibly have for a paper clip. When they ask little kids to do that, they come up with hundreds of uses for a paper clip. And they even imagine a world where the paper clip's not this big, but it's this big, and if it was this big, what you can do with it? They get really creative with this. When they follow those kids through adulthood and they hit adulthood, their ability to come up with uses for a paper clip goes down to like 10. So we've gone from hundreds to 10. And so the challenge I would give you in that situation is just take a step back. You know what? Maybe go, if you, if you drink alcohol, go get a round of drinks at a bar and say, how many creative solutions can we come up to in this problem? And maybe it's just you because you might not have a great relationship with the person that you're trying to compromise with. So maybe you just do it as an experiment. Just loosen up. Don't, don't put so many restrictions on yourself and see how creative you can be. And that's how I would approach that. Okay, an online question. What are your thoughts on approaching dealings with difficult people as a transaction rather than a relationship? Oh my God, dealing with difficult people. Um, I actually have, I have another presentation I do based on, on the book. And um, what I tell people about working with difficult people in that presentation is I put up an image on the screen of like a crazy lady in an insane asylum. Right? It's a crazy lady in an insane asylum. And what I ask them to do is imagine a difficult person that you just, you cannot stand this person. Imagine like, and I'll have, maybe even just have you guys do that in, in your heads right now. Imagine a person that they just make your blood boil. You don't want to work with them. Like you just don't know, you can't be successful with this person. Get a clear image of them in your head. And then what I want you to do is imagine them as a crazy lady in an insane asylum. Like the craziest possible person that you could possibly imagine. I wish I had the slide. Um, but the cra if you text in, I'll send you this exercise actually, because I want you to see this picture. Um, the craziest person you can imagine. The thing of it is, difficult people are very literally the crazy lady. They're literally the crazy lady. Because how we treat other people is a reflection of how we feel about ourselves. And so how would we approach the crazy lady in this situation? We're not going to be aggressive with the crazy lady, are we? No, I would hope not. We might be a little bit softer, a little bit more empathetic with the crazy lady. Um, we might approach things a little bit differently. I'll tell you what, I once had, um, oh God, I should definitely not admit this on video. I once had a meeting with a, with a, a CEO of one of my clients, but it was over a video chat, so I, I decided it was just over my computer. And I did not want to have this meeting. 
I was dreading this meeting and because and I knew we did not really have a great working relationship. And what I ended up doing was during the conference call, I put the picture of the crazy lady over her face. So I was looking at the crazy lady. <laughs> Best call I've ever had with the woman. <laughs> Because I wasn't aggressive. I wasn't trying to hammer away my point. I was much more receptive to what she was saying just because I was, I was approaching her as a crazy lady, which is what she was. She's a very stressed out person. Um, so that's, you gotta change your story about the people you're working with, especially the difficult people. I don't even know where my question is. Oh, um, oh, so we've introduced the idea of disc assessments at our work, and I know like a few years ago, um, everybody at the firm did it, and now we're talking about doing it again. Yeah. And one idea we had was putting like everybody's types on their doors. Yeah. Is that something you recommend? Yes, 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 yes. If you're going to do disc assessments, make people share what their type is, because a lot of times people want to be private about that information. It's no secret. It's not, your, your coworkers already know. Okay, so make them share and have those conversations, absolutely. Okay, unfortunately we're at time. Um, if Carlin's willing to stay a little bit yeah. after um, to answer questions, we'll be happy to do that. And I apologize for the couple of people online who have questions. We'll try and get those to her so she can answer them. Um, but I know Nicola yeah. has a couple of announcements that we wanna make sure that we get before everybody leaves, yeah. so. So I'll let Nic as Nicola's coming up, I'll just say, if you have a question that I didn't get to, send me an email. I have business cards up here too, um, and I'll ha be happy to respond as soon as I can, okay? Thank you guys all.